uh, on YouTube, you're able to ask questions in the YouTube chat. So please feel free uh, to type your question in. Uh, our, our esteemed producer, Becca Refford, will be keeping track of those and throwing them out at us, at us as they come along. So let's give it another minute and then we'll get started. Just going to turn off a few things here. So I'll turn my. Can we lost you? slacking that's okay oh there he is i was setting up things i was turning things so last week i was dumb enough to forget to turn off my notifications and then i had to turn them on live so everyone saw my notifications yeah. so i'm like i better turn that off hey everybody how are you it is tech chat tuesdays can you hear him <laughs> I can't hear him. I can hear you. Hey, hey. hey. he's back. I, I'm back as pathetically as I possibly can be. Yes. Um, so yeah. So here I am. Welcome everybody. Uh, Ken Rimple from Chariot Solutions, and we are here for Tech Chat Tuesday. I am learning how to use computer for the very first time. Clearly, <laughs> someone shipped me an Atari 2600, and that didn't work, so I gave up on it. I'm using a PC. I'm actually I'm using a Mac. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is Tuesday, uh, July 21st, 2020, um, and we have a couple segments here we're going to talk about different topics. The first one is we're going to do a dev news as we do every week. Please, if you're watching this, if you have questions, you want to comment on something, throw them in the YouTube chat, and we will be able to uh, get to those and talk to you and answer questions or relay your comments back to the group. Um, and then uh, beyond that, we're going to start with a little bit of dev news. And then our main topic today is going to be, we uh, have a special guest, Keith Gregory of Chariot Solutions, who is going to talk about uh, a project with Elasticsearch, and in general, Elasticsearch on AWS. Uh, so without further ado, let me do a few quick things here. And we'll put ourselves in a nice view to look at stuff. All right, here we go. So dev news time. The first dev news, uh, all these things uh, to begin with are rotating around um, uh, React Native. So let's take a quick couple seconds and talk about uh, React Native. Um, React Native is a JavaScript framework written with the React uh, component framework uh, so that JavaScript developers can write applications that are targeted towards mobile devices, um, iOS, Android. Uh, as well as browsers uh, as well. Um, and it turns out that they can use uh, native widgets and native uh, componentry. Uh, so they're actually standing up an iOS chooser or an input box on Android. And so it's using React's uh, APIs to generate mobile applications that then run in a native runtime on a phone. It's been around for a number of years. Uh, I'm going to start you off by just pointing out the React Native uh, CC uh, here. React Native CC is a really, really good newsletter uh, newsletter on all things React Native. It's excellent. Uh, I've been subscribed to it for years, and they've got a lot of really good articles. So um, React Native, there's a couple things that are going on. First of all, starting off, uh, Khan Academy uh, has a really good write-up of how they were using uh, native applications uh, for the Khan Academy apps. And they have, uh, in 2017, started moving over to doing uh, React Native instead of just plain old uh, native applications. Um, and so there's, there's an entry on here uh, where Brian Clark uh, of Khan Academy starts talking about these things. Uh, main thing and the main reason that a lot of people uh, end up with React Native is they don't want to maintain multiple uh, mobile development uh, code bases. You know, one of the biggest problems is you're, you're, you want to write an application that runs in iOS and Android. Now you got to go find an Android developer and iOS developer. And what can you really share on the, 
you know, client side, on the, on the phone side, the artwork's different because the layouts are different. Um, you know, all, all the different uh, screen resolutions and retargeting is different. So one thing that does a relatively good job at keeping things sized right is CSS and HTML. Um, and so, you know, they, they took the attitude of, well, we'll build these React components. And the React components run basically uh, in the phone as if they were running on a browser, but they access native components in Android and iOS. So Khan Academy decided they didn't want to maintain these two different code bases. Uh, and, you know, they had different bugs. They had different feature development they had to deal with. And they had a small mobile team. Uh, and they were already using React, so they already had the people uh, that could pick up this stuff. Um, and they, they raise a, a couple of really good points here. Like, for example, you know, there will be different bugs on different platforms. Uh, certainly, you will have that with React Native. You do have these, you know, I guess they're peer uh, objects where you've got a, a window peer or a menu peer or whatever, so to speak, a component that is implemented natively. So there could be differences there. Uh, but completely different when you have different native platforms because they're not even based on a common thing. They're just native iOS or native Android things. Um, and so that can be difficult to deal with. Um, implementing new features, you had to get Android designers, iOS designers uh, involved and, you know, engineers for the same thing. So it, it, that could be tedious. Uh, and then if you have to change a feature, you're changing two code bases. So these are all reasons where it starts to look like maybe something that in some cases, uh, unless you're doing a really a, a very resource intensive, rich game or something like that, or virtual reality, uh, it may make some sense to look at a shared code base. Um, and so those are some of the major reasons, you know, the architecture itself, you got different libraries and things like that. Um, and so they've been going through, like I said, since 2017, they started with a pilot project. Uh, and, you know, they, they, uh, they started off by, by trying a few things. They had the search tab in, in React Native. Um, they had like some sort of bridge between the different pieces of code, um, whatever that was. And then they started implementing certain pieces from 2017 to 2018. Um, and so that some things were done in React Native and some things were done natively. Uh, and then they, they, like they, like they called it extinction, right? So they finally realized they could do it uh, and they really basically rolled it out everywhere. Um, so let's see here. So now it looks like they do still have some uh, native app stuff too, which I guess is, you know, part of the game. Um, so the React Native for the contents of the screen and native code for navigation around those screens, which I guess makes sense. If you think about like the way that these mobile devices work with navigation, you really want to kind of have the native access to things. So I guess they felt that it was better to keep the shell of the application uh, to be uh, dealing with navigation. Um, so there's that. Uh, so the business logic is in the screen's content, so that sits in React Native. Uh, but the navigation bars and navigation controllers, um, basically it looks like they're doing those in an actual UI view controller or whatever it is in iPhone, for example. Uh, they also uh, have to deal with things like internationalization. It's Khan Academy, right? So they run everywhere. Um, you know, so they've got to be able to translate things. Uh, and in JavaScript, there's a pretty good story for some of that stuff. Um, there's a lot of different libraries out there for that. Uh, and especially, like I think in React, and definitely with Angular, there's a lot of uh, native, uh, localization libraries out there that are available. Um, but anyway, you can, I'll, I'll leave the rest of this for people to read. Um, so for example, you know, they're, they're talking about like how React Native feels. Um, you know, for example, uh, this developer liked Swift and he missed it because now he's going to JavaScript. That could be kind of painful. You go from a really rich language down to uh, a common denominator language like JavaScript. That can be somewhat painful. Of course, you can use TypeScript. Um, you know, so he feels that like the the uh, the, the React Native U, UI look and feel uh, is a little more controllable, malleable, uh, and developer tooling is really good um, with Visual Studio Code. Um, and he's also saying that you know working with Android isn't really a big Android developer, but is getting an app application done in Android, which is one of the reasons you do this, is that maybe someone deals with the Chrome around everything, and that's native if, in this case, and then uh, you, you go and do the rest of the application in a JavaScript React-based front end. So interesting talk uh, in here. A um, couple other things going on, um, uh, just briefly. So they have this uh, engineering project called Goliath, 
turns out they're switching their back end to Go. So they're converting a lot of their back end into Go services, and they're going to be using GraphQL as well. So it looks like GraphQL for querying uh, against Go services to then lay out in React Native, which is an interesting stack. Next thing, uh, we have in React Native version 0 0.63 was released. Uh, they have a, a log box tool uh, for dealing with logging experiences, and uh, they've upgraded that, uh, redesigned it, uh, and it looks like it, it, it uh, deals with you know, your log output, uh, so it's a component for that. So that's a new thing there. Um, let's see here. There is now a pressable component. Uh, so, you know, when you put a button on a component, the button usually triggers some event in the component itself, and the state is in the component itself. Uh, what they're talking about here is the pressable component. I'll just kind of bring this up a little bit. Of course, now I've lost it. There it is, the pressable component. So now it responds to all sorts of different inputs, touch inputs, you know, triggering through enter or clicking. So they're all kind of the same. Uh, it also, uh, the plan is that it's going to handle other events as well. Um, find that in here somewhere. Always good to read while looking. Um, anyway, they're, they're looking at having different events like, oh, here, here it is. Uh, hover, blur, focus, and other events as well to be folded into this and they feel that uh, developers will pick up that feature and run with it. So Pressable is part of 0 0.63. Um, they now have a native colors, a platform color plot, uh, uh, tool. So you can actually say, what is the standard color for a link on my phone? So if, if your phone has theme ability or if it, you know, you've got accessibility turned on, uh, like high contrast mode, it will pick those up. So some pretty good things there. Uh, there's like a platform color object. And so for example, I can say, I want a text of the style of, hey, give me the color for the platform color label, right? So that way, before you would have to actually work this with some sort of palette you'd put together um, and detect things, but now this is automatic. So it'll automatically fetch from the phone what the actual color palette is. So another nice feature in React Native. Um, and there's other things as well, like for example, they're dropping Node 8 support in iOS 9. So uh, yeah, you can check that out, uh, and that's on the React Native blog, reactnative.dev slash blog. Let's switch topics for a second here, and Keith, if you want to chime in, go ahead. <laughs> we, uh, we, as a consulting firm, Chariot works with Amazon a lot, and we work with other cloud providers too, and I know some of the things that have been moving in that world in the last decade, we've gone from virtual machines to containers uh, and now we're looking at people moving out and implementing serverless in a lot of places. And when, when I say serverless, serverless is a very big topic, right? Um, there are serverless services like a database that's offered without you mounting a server and starting it up or, you know, a queue or something like that. But in terms of writing your mobile or web apps and making the, the, the application itself serverless, meaning it runs a bunch of functions that you deploy, um, that's what I'm talking about specifically in this blog post by Alexei Pushkin uh, in IT Next. Um, he calls it serverless frameworks resource hell. And I'll take another moment on this and talk about the fact that the word serverless is also overloaded as a, as a framework, as a concept. So there is a framework called the serverless framework. Uh, it was created uh, in, I guess, about five or six, maybe even longer years ago. Uh, and it's a framework that generates native serverless technologies for Amazon and for Google and other cloud uh, frameworks. So it's basically a, a framework for deploying serverless functions, lambdas, in the cloud. And it's not owned by any cloud provider. But then there, for example, is AWS's serverless uh, framework that they have, which is kind of their own take on that. Um, and then there's other things uh, out there. There are like tons of other smaller frameworks uh, out there um, that, that are, are another kind of take on rolling out serverless technologies. It seems like all of these are struggling with generating the right boilerplate to get something done. Right, Keith? Yeah. Well, as you recently discovered with a project you were working on, there is just an enormous amount of stuff that you need to deploy uh, even a fairly standard web application written in Java uh, onto, you know, as you used a container system. And I think a lot of the frameworks forget about that. 
So things like creating the VPC with all the, the uh, private and public subnets and uh, creating the database, creating the secrets, passing the secrets in and out to be able to access the database. As it turns out, as you discovered, the actual deployment uh, you were using ECS, the Elastic Container Service, is a tiny part of your overall uh, infrastructure and a tiny yeah. amount of work. Um, it's all that upfront work, right? Yeah. It's all and that it's, upfront it's work. Wiring things together. Uh, I talked with a client of ours. Uh, we were working on a different project. They were looking to, to kind of blend together different teams producing their own serverless uh, deployments that would then hook into one centralized deployment and we batted around a few ideas but it gets it gets incredibly challenging I actually have a blog post that I think I told you about earlier that I'm in the middle of writing called chicken and egg and it <laughs> contrasts how in a traditional deployment you build out your infrastructure and then you deploy your application onto it whether it's a Java war or just a node.js or whatever uh, and you know, you know me, I like containers. Uh, yeah. Versus serverless, where you're kind of building up your infrastructure at the same time you're doing your deployment. And as you evolve your, your application, it it's kind of an interesting uh, challenge to say, okay, where do I draw the line? Do I draw the line? Yeah, so, right, right. I agree. I mean, that's part of the problem is that you look at the serverless approach and then everything you need needs to have its role mapped and its resources mapped and it's got to be deployed. So do you deploy them in one cloud formation stack or you do it in multiple cloud formation stacks? And then, you know, I just find a lot of that being friction. You know, my, my biggest issue with, with uh, serverless as an approach, and this, by the way, quick plug, <laughs> uh, in the July meeting of the Suburban Philly Cloud and DevOps group, which uh, Joel Confino, a Chariot alum, uh, is, is hosting at uh, Vanguard, um, he invited me to, to give a talk, and I, I did a talk at ETE that I'm, I'm kind of condensing down uh, into a, into a roux <laughs> uh, called serverless schmerverless, only as a kind of a cheeky joke to, to make fun of it, but, um, you know, kind of poke fun at the world. But it's really a challenge that I don't want the friction of having to think about all these interfaces between layers. I'd like to try to write code that I can quickly refactor and move around with a container with all the code in it. Um, you know, why do I have to break up into multiple lambdas and lambda layers and have each of those have all those 10 different things they need just to launch? It's going to slow me down. And so, for example, now for two projects in a row, I've shot down serverless as an option because we didn't know how big the project was going to be and how many things were going to change. Um, it wasn't like I wanted to, like, adapt a log, right, and, and move a log content into S3, and it was one lambda and we're done. It was like... There's a expandable amount of business logic and code to write, and I didn't want to be tied down to deploying something which takes its own energy and effort. So I think this is what this guy is really talking about here. He's, you know, he's his in his uh, discussions. Now, uh, in my quick scan of this article uh, that Alexei Pushkin did, um, he's mentioning, for example, like, well, you got the deployment process. You've got a for a lambda a function in in Amazon. You have to upload the code to S3 somehow. Uh, and then, you know, deploy the resources or at least write your, your template to put the stuff into S3. And it, it's a two-step right. process, right? So there's all of that. Um, but then, like, for example, for Lambda, you need the resources you're going to access. You need to set up a role and then policies for that role. So let's say you've got, uh, you need to do a, a message to a queue and send an email and write to S3. Well, for every Lambda you build, if you follow the principal least privilege you're in there, you know, locking down only the policy that Lambda needs. Right. And that's just tedium, you know? So so that's what this guy's talking about. And his solution for some of this, he, he ran into one issue, which was the DynamoDB. Uh, the, here's a scenario. The most obvious scenario is a process of restoring your table from a native backup. In the case of DynamoDB, your native backup can only be restored into a new table. Therefore, you should either redirect your functions to a restored table or delete an original corrupted table and create a new one from backup with the same name, blah, 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 blah. In the end, he said, you know what? We're going to use the AWS CLI for this, or maybe you could use something like the, the CDK, or perhaps the, the development kit. Um, I, I, I think that, 
offers a lot of promise using the CDK because you can have temp basically templated builds that you can stamp out and you can potentially not have to uh, not have to deal with uh, I, I have some negative feelings against Sam which is the Amazon serverless and those right. are my personal feelings uh, but yeah I think CDK offers a lot of possibilities there and the approach that I'm I go down again uses the AWS CLI to be more of a traditional deployment framework mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's how much you want to wholeheartedly dive into uh, dive into the serverless world yeah and, and you know, there are people that do like whole you know uh, node JS applications as a function for the entry point right so right. the entry point function is what you mount but you're really mounting the entire JavaScript framework, and you know I guess you're probably doing Webpack to turn into one giant script file. But that feels like it's serverless just to be serverless, as opposed to serverless for the right reason. Right. right. So, and there are other frameworks out there. Like one of the ones I was looking at was Architect. Um, I'll bring this up br briefly. Arc.codes, uh, and I really like what they're doing. Um, if you're if you're looking at like a lightweight, and by the way, they behind the scenes they are using I believe they're using Sam and and they're using CloudFormation for you. So it's, there's, there's no free lunch. Somewhere it's got to happen, right? Because right. Of the, the, native, the native way that the Amazon stuff is deployed is through resources created on Amazon. And so you can't get around it. But the idea is you could write a simple function, um, you know, kind of expose these things, uh, and then just write a simple function for them, and then they get deployed. And he's got, you know, all sorts of things like, you know, WebSocket support, static assets, CDNs. So just a whole bunch of little resources you would need in a regular application to write. That said, you're going into a world where you've got to be an expert in architect. And now that's a, a very isolated world. It's cool. It's neat. It's powerful. But at the same time, when do you run out of that? You know, so I, I just, none of these things I've seen so far, I'm not ready to jump into any of them with two feet. I'm just not yet. Um, let's see here. So where are we? All right, so that covered the serverless thing. So anyway, if you look at his article, you know, he points out that, like, you know, he's ended up doing the AWS command. This is the AWS CLI. So he's doing, like, AWS DynamoDB create table and, you know, waiting for it to exist and then doing different things. So, um, and that's a quick example. So, you know, quick, if you're curious about what someone else has done when they're wrestling with serverless, you can check that out. And as you mentioned, the July meetup. Yeah, you were going to say something, Keith? No, no. Okay. Hey, so um, it's funny. I was asking Keith last week about, uh, we were talking about postmortems and things that go bump in the night and how they're documented out there. And it uh, turns out that we were talking briefly about Claire, Cloudflare's blogs, which are excellent. Um, they go through and they talk a lot about what they find. Uh, and so they had a really big outage on July 17th. Um, so it looks like that uh, there was a configuration error. They were having issues with traffic. And so they tuned something. And when they tuned it, they basically flooded it, right, and uh, shut down their, uh, their, their Cloudflare DNS services, uh, or probably the CDN. Um, the whole uh, thing basically was offline for 27 minutes uh, and saw a traffic drop about 50% across their network. So they lost a lot of, uh, you know, uh, edge uh, point content. Um, Keith, did you read this one? Do you have any thoughts on this I, one? I read the blog post. I can't remember details from it. Yeah, 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 uh, that's fine. You know, one of our colleagues uh, Friday afternoon I think it was like quarter past five or something we were still on slack he said is anyone else having problems let me uh, let me check is it down or one of the down detectors he says yep it's down too mm -hmm. and, uh, you know I, I like using the the tools like dig to try and do a DNS lookup and said yeah seems like cloud is having a problem and uh, sure enough the next day I saw this blog post uh, Saturday and it's like you know, the thing that gets me about this, though, is they dug into it. They're explaining what's going wrong. And that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, you may like Cloudflare. You may be scared of them. Uh, there was another blog post from one of their part, part competitors talking about half the Internet running on Cloudflare. But uh, they really dig into what's wrong. They really give you a feeling that they are on top of things. So as a, a general idea, I like their their blogs. Uh, Stripe, if I recall, is also one that I've read and really gives you the feeling that, yes, we know what is causing you pain, 
we want to make sure that you know that we know. And as a general practice, I think it's great. Yeah, the site reliability engineering, basically, we're talking about here, right? So what what they're doing is they're, they're, they're headlining, yes, there was a mistake made. We're sorry about the mistake. We're not going to sit and pillory someone for it, but we're going to talk about what it was and how we're going to stop it from happening in the future. So this right. is a perfect illustration of a really good postmortem. Um, you know, John Graham coming lays this out nicely, talks about all the locations that were down, and he says, for the avoidance of doubt, this was not caused by an attack or breach of any kind. And it was a global backbone configuration change. Which, um, that's kind of an important thing. I want to jump in. Cloudflare, yep. you've seen some of their blog posts where they get, uh, I want to say multiple, multiple terabits per second, but I know that's too low. I think it's dozens of terabits uh, mm -hmm. per second attacks against their infrastructure constantly. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's a, a big fear, I think. Uh, you know, it is attacking infrastructure such as Cloudflare, such as GitHub, is a way uh, that we're moving forward in a world of really kind of easy to take down the infrastructure. Um, yeah. so I think it's important that they called that out. Yeah, being vigilant and, and bringing up the things that they tuned and tightened uh, in the attacks they've had, and they're on there, on the on their blog. Um, so the interesting thing is, you know, these are this is a typical postmortem, right? You have a, you have what happened, um, you have an explanation of the architecture of what was happening, and you have a timeline, right? So they have a nice uh, breakdown of everything that happened. So um, first, an issue occurred in the backbone link between Newark and Chicago, which led to backbone congestion in between Atlanta and Washington, D.C. And responding to it, a configuration change was made in Atlanta. Um, and then at, at uh, 9.12 um, uh, UTC uh, p.m., uh, everything went down from there. Uh, and once they fixed it, uh, it was back up and running by you know, 9.39 UTC uh, p.m. So at least it, it goes through all the different things to do. They talk about like even like the impact, if they look at their internal traffic manager tool. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to interpret these things, but uh, they're basically saying, here's what happened. The, this is what was configured. And then what they're doing to fix it is they're introducing a maximum prefix limit on their backbone sessions. It would have shut down one backbone, but the network would be functioning without one. Uh, and so basically they're tuning it so they can't have this particular thing happen again. So that's a good postmortem. In fact, if you go to postmortems, you'll see all of their postmortems and you can kind of look through those. So just kind of a, an echo back to last week's uh, podcast or, and uh, show uh, where they, they talk about all these different things that have happened and what they've dealt with. Okay, coming up next, uh, let's talk about some events going on at Chariot. Uh, so we have a virtual networking uh, event from, uh, let's see, from Chariot. It's a, it's a product tank event. Pete Fleming runs these for us. Uh, I believe this is going to be done on Zoom, um, but uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer conversations, and he's going to have a, a meetup talking about, uh, let's see, what's he doing here? Uh, they doing... Usually, can you hear my audio? Because I know I just I hear you. The top of the screen. Yeah, I hear you, Becca. Go ahead. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So, product tank is typically tutorial based or like workshop based. So he's just trying something new, like basically offering a Zoom, allowing a place for people to kind of connect more organically and naturally. Great. So that's going to be on Monday, July twenty seventh, yeah. at twelve p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So if you want to hook uh, into that talk, you can you can you know just talk to people about your uh, product ideas and uh, about, I guess, uh, design and UX there. So that's that, and it's free. So, you know, please feel free. Chariot sponsors it, uh, and it's a, a good event. Um, we had a recent Lunch and Learn. Uh, Tracy Wilson Rossman uh, had some guests, and the topic was every company is a tech company. Uh, just talking about how you're going to end up dealing with tech issues and, and being somewhat of a technologist or having technologists in your team wrestle with things. Uh, even if you think you're just a product company uh, that doesn't have a technology focus. So her uh, guests were Michael Vener uh, Venera, uh, C Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer in Independence Blue Cross, Bridget Daniel, from uh, Executive Vice President from Wilco Electronic Systems, Chad Stender, Managing Director of 76 Capital, and Emily Yates, Smart City Director, City of Philly. So she had a, a good combination of different types of companies there. Uh, for her conversation, and that is available on Chariot's website in the uh, if the resources screencast section is where that is. 
Uh, and that leaves us to the topic we're going to talk about today with Keith. So Keith, I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to kind of hand this over to you a little bit, but let's talk a bit about Elasticsearch. Sure. So you, yeah. So you just to, to level set it real quick. So uh, Elasticsearch is a product out there, right? Elastic.co, a search indexing tool, right? Uh, and it's a company that runs this, but we're specifically talking about Elasticsearch on AWS, I believe, in our main well, topic. I'll talk about Elasticsearch with a couple of different different topics. So right. yes, Elasticsearch is a search engine. Uh, Elasticsearch is built on the Lucene search engine, which is an open source indexing library that's also used by uh, the Solar search engine. So Elasticsearch and Solar kind of divvied up the market for putting a REST interface, a REST API on top of Lucene. And Elasticsearch has gotten fairly well known for the so-called ELK stack, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, which is a set of tools that let you gather up your application logs and access them through a search engine. And this is particularly uh, enjoyable for developers, uh, speaking as a developer, because it lets you really dive into logs. and back you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, logs weren't that interesting. You, you wrote them as files. Uh, you might have a monolithic web server or web application server that's writing log files, and you'd occasionally use them to try and figure out what went wrong. Uh, 15 years ago, there was always limited disk space to write these logs on, so you generally didn't write enough information to actually make them useful. In the intervening time, disk space is cheap. Search engines have uh, really become easy to, to deploy and use. And applications have split from monoliths into a lot of cooperating pieces. So now the problem is not just going and looking at a text file somewhere to figure out what went wrong, but looking at the logs written by, say, five different components to see everything that's touched with a single request coming into your servers. And search engines really make that possible. And Elastic uh, kind of jumped on that. Uh, I was about to say jumped on that bandwagon, but it's really <laughs> jumped on that uh, need, need, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, early on with the Elk stack uh, and really kind of they are the search engine that you think about when you think about uh, really monitoring your applications. And we have one at Chariot. We have a Elasticsearch cluster set up that records every API call to our AW across all of our AWS accounts. So I know I've showed you that in the past. You want to find out who started up a machine six weeks ago and didn't bother to tag it with their name. He'll find you. you. Just Take that instance ID, pop it into Kibana, and now you see everything that's happened with that machine. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so, okay. So we got the Elastic uh, company itself, right? So this was, like you said, it was an open source, uh, originally an open source uh, API on top of um, Lucene. Lucene. And, uh, but now they formed their own company. And they've got the Elk stack and, and, and everything going here. Uh, so they sell this. And I also noticed they sell this on AWS the AWS Marketplace. So like uh, if you go over to the AWS Marketplace, there's Elasticsearch on Elastic Cloud. But then Amazon has their Elasticsearch service. So what up with all this? What is going on? Uh, so there is a lot of furor over this, in fact. Um, furor? Yes. Mm. Uh, and it's the idea that Elastic is looking to make money by basically providing services around a core open source product. And that's, you know, that's what um, Stallman considered to be the true goal of open source and corporate uh, management of open source. Mm -hmm. But Amazon basically took the open source product, made their own deployment, and I saw something, I don't have the source and I don't know if it's true, that Amazon makes more money selling machine time for Elasticsearch than Elastic makes. Uh, Might be, their reach is huge. 
Yeah, so there is quite a bit of furor over that. Mm -hmm. And with the the reason that it works so well is Amazon Elasticsearch is a managed service. So you spin up your Elasticsearch cluster, you tell it how many nodes you want to cluster. And that's, by the way, one of the really nice things of Elasticsearch that they did, even though Solar, I believe, does that now, Elasticsearch from the very beginning would divide up uh, your data amongst multiple nodes in a cluster so that it could have a higher performance retrieval and uh, indexing as well as uh, redundancy. So at any rate, Amazon created this product that uh, you basically tell it how many nodes you want and how much storage you want, and that's all you have to do. Uh, the node goes down in the middle of the night. Uh, Amazon's automated equipment will swap it out for another node. You find out that uh, you've under-provisioned or over-provisioned your cluster, and uh, you can just very easily go into the console and say, OK, instead of six nodes, I want 12 nodes. And it will take care of expanding out your cluster. The trade-off of that and why Elastic um, has its product offerings is that Amazon has kind of tuned down the number of knobs that you can turn to make it work. Uh, so again, you can pick the instance type number of nodes. Uh, you have some level of configuration over your index templates, how, how your indexes are structured. Uh, but if you have an actual elastic implementation on your own, you have an enormous number of knobs that you can turn to tune it to exactly what you want. And to give you an idea of this, I set up an elastic search cluster for logging that uh, gathered about 30 gigabytes a day of log data, which sounds like a lot. Uh, the cluster as a whole, I think, was three terabytes. Uh, we had redundant storage, the whole thing. Uh, and that worked incredibly well on a managed elastic search cluster. Uh, one of my friends, former colleagues, was dealing with a search cluster that ingested a terabyte a day. And they only maintained a week. But to be able to deal with their ingest rates, uh, they ended up going with self-managed cluster, basically okay. taking the Elasticsearch software uh, and installing it on their own cluster of machines. And they could physically tune so, everything the way they wanted it, yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big thing, and Amazon, uh, the managed Elasticsearch misses out on a lot of the uh, proprietary tools that Elastic has for the proprietary project. So for example, a few years ago, I put out an article on my personal blog about using Lambda to trigger every night and clean up old log indexes, because otherwise you just keep consuming space for your indexes mm -hmm. and uh, eventually run out of space. Whereas the man self-managed, you do that yourself. Okay. So now um, you had a project recently that you worked on uh, with a with another developer, Chariot, um, that was uh, involving Elasticsearch. So let's talk a little bit about that, if we can, at, at, at least the high level, like sure. what it was, what the challenges were, and things like that. So this was our client uh, actually produces a product uh, in the training space, and they had been using a. Uh, uh, what is the content management system, CMS, that um, they were kind Drupal. of pushing it. Was it Drupal or something like that? No, no, it was it was a third-party CMS okay. that um, they interfaced with. Oh, yeah, I'm starting to, in the back of my mind. But anyway, so it's a third-party okay. CMS. <laughs> and included search. And they were yeah. simply finding that uh, with the number of clients they had, they were taxing this uh, structure. Mm -hmm. So they... Uh, as part of a large rewrite of their back end and re-architecture of their back end, they wanted to bring in an Elastic, elastic Search, partic in particular Amazon managed Elastic Search, to take over the role of the search engine. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't a logging application. This was kind of more traditional, um, much like you'd use with Google for a search engine, that you say, OK, I want to find out the training courses for this specific activity. Right. Uh, so that was a fairly simple search query for Elasticsearch. What made it a little bit challenging is that their content was in, I think, 27 different languages. 
Uh, they had a very large number of clients. Mm -hmm. And they also had additional keywords that would be attached to all of the search content. So we went in and worked with them uh, with two iterations, actually. Uh, the first iteration of the project uh, was written in Python on Lambda and uh, ingested their content and was able to ingest content in multiple languages but uh, and provide all the search functionality. But one thing that, that once we had done that, they decided, you know, what we'd also like to do is to be able to ingest things like PDF documents and Word documents and tie those to the training. And that actually ended up, we fairly quickly re-implemented in Java, again on Lambda, nothing had changed, uh, using, I can't remember the name of the library, it's an Apache library that basically can read many different formats and uh, extract the content from them so that we could then index it. So it's a fairly straightforward use of Elasticsearch. It's a little bit challenging having the 27 different languages and making sure that we and the client knew how to uh, deal with certain things. For example, in Japanese, uh, they had lists of strings that were comma separated, so terms that you might search for. In Japanese, the comma is not really a comma. So oh, really? you have to recognize that and properly break up the, the lists for sense. Japanese. Sure, yeah. yeah. But where, where I kind of like the approach we took is uh, what approach, which uh, you, I think you had the page from the Chariot up. blog up. And the idea, if you scroll down, you'll see an architecture diagram for it. It's a, what I think is a very simple way of uh, triggering lambdas and processing data that's being uploaded. And the idea is that you have your client, whatever it is, I show it as a browser here or a PC here, but in their case, it was their actual main application, dropping files into a staging bucket on S3 and then dropping that file triggers a Lambda to do some sort of processing. In this case, it was moving the content of the file into Elasticsearch and making sure it was properly indexed. And then the Lambda, as a result, moves, after it's finished, moves the file into the archive bucket. And the idea with this has a couple of benefits. One is you know that it's running. You know, one of the big problems of observability in general is knowing that your application is actually doing something. And uh, the way this works, if you ever see files remaining in the staging bucket, you know that something's gone wrong and you can start tracking it down. And it also keeps an archive of everything that it's done uh, so that you can go back in the future and, for example, if you want to redeploy, you simply copy all the files from the archive bucket back into the staging bucket and now it just processes them again. It's basically using the same approach to initial processing, reprocessing, uh, a very, what I like is a simple approach to a problem that can be very easily be over-engineered with all sorts of queues and different processing steps and uh, so forth. Okay, so the, yeah, that we have a link to that as well. We're posting uh, on our blog. Uh, again, it's called Two Buckets and a Lambda Pattern for File Processing. Uh, that's a good good uh, note here. Uh, in terms of like uh, managing uh, the care and feeding of Elasticsearch on AWS, like what are some of the things that, that come up in terms of costs and like, you know, how do you get charged for this thing in general? Don't want to put you on the spot on the numbers, but in general, uh, like what I've would you say? These numbers. Yeah, right. So <laughs> you, get, you get charged based on the instance type mm -hmm. uh, and the amount of storage you have. And Amazon, I'm pretty sure they do the fairly standard Amazon charges you either eight cents or 10 cents per gigabyte month for storage. Okay. So if you're storing a terabyte, you're looking at either 80 or $100 per month that you're paying for that. Then you get paid based on the number of instances and uh, what instance class. So just like EC2, Elasticsearch has a T2 small, M5 extra large, uh, and they have a certain premium on top of that. So you pay a per hourly rate. So to give you an idea of this, that uh, log-based, that log search installation that I set up, uh, 
we were paying, we had six nodes, three terabytes of storage space. I think we were paying about 1400 a month for, for a log analysis, which sounds really pretty expensive. Uh, but if you think about that, once you have that in place and once you start really generating usable logging information, which is a challenge in and of itself, and we could do another talk on that. Yeah, right. Uh, you're now leveraging your developer's time. So if you have a developer who's costing you $100,000 a year and who can get an answer to a production problem in 15 minutes versus spending all day, uh, I, th I think that's very much worthwhile. Just upping their value to the organization by giving them better and faster tools. Better, than, yeah. better tools, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, are, are there any other kind of novel uh, uses that you've done in the past with Elasticsearch? No, I, I came to Elasticsearch primarily um, for log analysis, security mm -hmm. analysis. Uh, I've worked quite a bit trying to feed Elasticsearch. One of my personal open source projects is uh, a logging appender library for uh, the three main logging frameworks, Log4j1, Log4j2, and Logback, that writes into Kinesis and has a nice Kinesis pipeline from Amazon Kinesis into a mess, an elastic search. Uh, it also handles CloudWatch logs, which seems to be what everybody uses it for. Uh, mm -hmm. I much prefer elastic search. Gotcha. All right. Hey, uh, Becca, just a real quick question. Do you have any uh, comments out there? Nope. All good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Going. Okay. That's great. All right. So, um, Keith, anything else you want to wrap up with on that or? No. No, I think, you know, you would ask for one of the things to pay attention to, and we yeah. ended up talking about cost. If you're managing Elasticsearch in general, but definitely on AWS, pay attention to how much disk space you're using and uh, how close you are to getting up against your limits of disk space. One of the problems, if you go out, a lot of people complain about AWS managed Elasticsearch, that they didn't pay attention, they filled up their disk and then they couldn't actually increase the size. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's one of the things that you're not in control of this. If you find that you're at 66% of disk utilization, it's easy enough to add on a few more nodes. If you're at 99%, you may have problems doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if you get completely full, you're basically out of the water until you can resolve it, I'm guessing, right? That's the point. Right. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's again, the trade-off with managed is managed handles a lot of things for you. You don't have to think about operations, but you do still have to pay attention to it. Gotcha. And Keith did a really good webinar. I know we blasted this on the last live stream that we did, but um, the AWS things I learned the hard way. So a lot of lessons learned, war stories. That was a really good one. So I'll drop a link over in the comments too. Yep. Thanks. That was, that was searching for that now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That was not just me. It was also a uh, former colleague, Eric Schmidt and mm -hmm. Bill Thompson from Lafayette. Yep. Yep. In fact, if you go to youtube.com, this is going to be fun watching me type, but uh, if you go to Chariot Solutions, we have our own channel there and uh, there's a lot of really good stuff sitting on that channel. Um, and I know that's in there somewhere. You're not in sharing, there. by the way. Oh, uh, well, not allowed. <laughs> no okay. one lets me anymore. No, there it is. So youtube.com slash Terry Solutions, and there it is. And so there's uh, different, uh, you know, different uh, playlists um, and uh, different videos out there. So tons. All right. So that's that's the uh, resources for you. Uh, thank you, Keith, for being with me today, oh, and Becca you. for doing the production. Sure, you're welcome. And uh, you know, any feedback, please leave it at, at TechCast um, or put you know comments in the uh, YouTube video when it goes uh, live. They're gonna run through conversion process and all the, the live chat that we had and all the, the links being pasted will be there as well. But please feel free to, you know, send us a, a positive thing, you know, like and subscribe as they say in the YouTube world. Uh, always good to get subscribers. And thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good one. Yep. See you guys in a week. Bye.